welcome to the BK Show podcast. This is episode number 45, and today I am joined by Ezra Firestone. Now, if you're in e-commerce whatsoever, you probably have already heard this name, but if in case you haven't, Ezra is the founder of Boom by Cindy Joseph. Uh, he is also the founder of One Click Upsell and Sipify Pages. He's the founder of Smart Marketer. Uh, he's got a lot going on, and I think if you've heard him on any other podcast before, it's very tactical. It's it's what's working now in one of his businesses or something he's teaching, and I really wanted to hear more about him. I wanted to hear his backstory. I wanted to know how he came up. How did he get started? Because it's easy to see people way out in front of where they are now. Um, and I personally suffer from a lot of comparitis. And so it's easy to see that and compare yourself against that, but not not really understand where they came from. And so I wanted to take Ezra back. I, I've heard him talk about growing up on a commune and I wanted to touch on that. I heard that he used to play uh, underground poker in New York and I wanted to touch on that too. And he started in, in drop shipping. And so we touch on all of that today. Today, it, it, to me, it was it was invaluable to hear where he came from, rather than where he is now. And so, I hope you really find value in this podcast of understanding Ezra's journey. Hey, real quick, I've got a lot of text messages from a previous episode uh, about uh, baby baby K and wondering whether he has arrived or not yet. So uh, we've had many false alarms, but he has not shown up yet. And actually the day this is scheduled to come out. So I'm recording it, uh, on June 15th here, this intro, but it is coming out on June 22nd. That is the day he is scheduled to come out. If he doesn't arrive, uh, over the course of the next seven days that, uh, that are ahead of us here. And so thank you for all the messages. I appreciate it. Uh, thankfully mom's doing great. Um, and hopefully baby comes on time and everything, uh, works out well. And uh, I'm sure my life's about to change radically, but I, I look forward to that. So thank you all for the text messages. Uh, uh, but yeah, let's uh, jump into today's show with Ezra Firestone. Ezra Firestone, welcome to the show, buddy. Ladies and gentlemen, I got my trusty poker chips here. Watch this. You can hear them in the mic. I'm always I'm always uh, sitting here on these. Anytime I do an interview, I'm I'm, I'm shuffling poker chips. Are you just um, but I'll try to keep it down. Time? Uh, I enjoy uh, fidgeting with things with my hands. It's not that I can't sit still, um, be, but it's just I totally can. I can set these down, but uh, there is something pleasurable about rotating these poker chips while I'm talking. I don't know. It's a thing I do. You know, I, I think it's why people invented the fidget spinners. You know, it's like fun to have something physical and tactile to like, you know, uh, to move around. To I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's a yeah, I don't know. I don't have other any other symptoms of ADHD or any of that kind of stuff, but I definitely do like to have things in my hands. Like I have these other things here. Um, I have these uh, these things, these balls that you rotate. Nice. So I'm the same as you. I, I I have this baseball in my hand, like almost all day long. Just you know, pitcher gets it back from the catcher, and they're always like rubbing the seams down. I'm I'm pretty much doing that all day long. Yeah. It's something about it. I don't know. It's something about the tactile experience of touching something while I'm thinking. It's I don't know. It uh, works for me. I don't know what it is, but uh, I'm not interested in changing it. <laughs> do you do anything like while you're while you're working, like on on a separate screen or anything? Like I'm always uh, I've got America's Card Room open on my on my Mac down here. I'm working on my two twenty sevens, and I've got like I'll just be in a you know fifteen dollar tournament or something on the on the on the bottom that's and just cool. play hands while I'm while I'm working all day. Well, actually, what I'm trying to stop doing is, and I'm not, actually, I don't know if I'm trying to stop doing it, but basically, when I'm on Zoom meetings, I'm also doing other things on my computer. I have two screens. I got one screen in front of me. I got one vertical screen. And so I'm on Zoom meetings, like listening to the team or talking or engaging, but I'm also like doing other things on my computer, emailing or what. So like I'm, and I'm thinking, I've had the thought, you know, maybe being a little more present in the actual meetings and not having a second or third cycle going on behind the scenes where I'm emailing someone or slacking someone. It's probably, um, you know, pr probably for certain meetings, it, it would be better for me to be even more present and not have an additional cycle that I'm engaged in. But many meetings at this point, you know, it's the team working with the team and I'm there for oversight or they got a question for me or to give feedback. So it's like, I do have the space and flexibility to also be doing something else. But there are certain times where I'm like, you know, I should probably on certain meetings not be doing that. I, I totally get it. And I've seen it even on podcasts where I'll, the guy I'm interviewing, his eyes are off to the right and, and working on stuff. And I I'm can like, I don't never do that on a podcast. Really? That's a <laughs> hard and fast rule. If I'm on a podcast, I'm looking at the person I'm talking to. I'm not doing some bullshit on the side because then it's like, 
you know, the last thing, first of all, somebody is giving us the gift of their time listening to this shit, you know? So it's like, I want to honor that person who is listening to this with my full attention. And I would be super annoyed if I was listening to a podcast and someone was both podcasting and doing some other shit. It's like, no, come on. You got to be present in this conversation or what are we doing here? You know? Well, I, you're a busy guy. I appreciate your time. It took a long time to be able to get you on this show. And I, I just, I appreciate your time. Uh, if, if people don't know who you are, what, what, what's a quick elevator pitch? Uh, I would hope everybody in the e-commerce world knows who Ezra Firestone is at this point. You know, in the business context, I'm, um, I'm a guy who started without any formal education, uh, barely made it out of high school, like really barely made it out. Um, I got involuntarily transferred, sort of a nice way for saying expelled out of one school. I just kind of got out by the skin of my teeth and, uh, failed out of junior college three years in a row. Um, you know, moved to New York at 18 to play, uh, poker on the New York city underground, um, fell into e-commerce in 05 and uh, fell in love with it. And, you know, I was looking for women and money. That's what I was after. My young brain thought that's what, that's what life was about, you know, figuring those things out. And, uh, and ultimately my, the, I started learning about money and, and, you know, systems and not trading time for money and not staying up all night with a bunch of degenerates named Vinny to limo. And, you know, I, I, anyways, long story short is I felt I got into e-commerce very early. I was 19 years old and I've been doing it for 15 years now, I'm 34, I'll be 35 in a few months, um, 16 years almost. And, um, I've been very successful at it, you know, and I've done, I've, I've had probably every, I've played every role, um, and every sort of occupational style and business that you can have agency, c- CPA marketer, affiliate marketer, developer, designer, copywriter, um, you know, e-commerce merchant, um, coach, consultant, educator. So I've just like been in this industry for a long time. And I was lucky enough to start blogging about it very early. I'd had a lot of success all the way by by 2012. I was already making, you know, a couple hundred grand a year in e-commerce, which for me, a guy who, you know, didn't grow up with money and never had, you know, never had access to any kind of resource that was huge. And so I started blogging about it. And that was uh, really fortunate because nobody was doing it back then. And so I became sort of the default guy, not because I was any better than anyone else. I was just the only one doing it. And that led me to having relationships with Shopify and them having me teach for them and putting out, and all of a sudden, you know, fast forward six years and, um, I keep getting better at e-commerce. I keep learning about being a business, you know, go the journey from solopreneur to, you know, uh, business owner to CEO to et cetera. Um, and here we are in 2021 and, you know, I've got a brand that'll do what my e-commerce brand will do probably 45 million this year. Uh, all of my brands, if you put them together over the last five years, have done about 150 million in revenue. Um, that's self-funded. That's no debt. I've got 130 employees and I have been consistently, I've made every mistake you can make along the way, by the way, you know, not paying the taxes and, you know, I've just done it all, all the bad things you can do. Luckily I did them when I was much, much smaller. And I learned and I blogged about it and I was open with my followers and fans about like, this is what struggles I'm going through. Here's what's going on. Here's what I think about this. And, you know, I've had the burnout experience. Like I've just had the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. Uh, and I've been able to share that with a group of people over time. And then that group of people's grown. And now I got, you know, a couple hundred thousand people on an email list and several hundred thousand fans and followers on social media. And I've become sort of a, uh, influencer, I guess is the word, but just like a, a person of note within a particular subculture, our subculture is online commerce. Uh, and I really love it, man. I love e-commerce. I love what I do. I love having companies. I love uh, solving problems. I love making a positive impact on the world. I love the opportunity to generate resource money and use that towards causes I find noble, taking care of my family, taking care of my community, uh, you know, putting resource towards things in the world that seem um, like they need that, you know, saving the waters, whatever it is. Uh, so, so I love it, man. I'm good at it and, and I'm having fun. And, um, and so I've become a bit, and what I realized too is, I did. I just thought I was sharing my journey with people and hopefully giving them some content that could help them on their journey. But what I've realized is that the influencer thing is so much bigger than that because you have this opportunity where you really do make an impact on people's lives. You really do. Not that I'm anything special, but just by like sharing what works for me and what doesn't, people then can use that 
on their journey. And so that feels really fulfilling and good. So I'm kind of rambling, but basically I'm just some guy who's been doing this shit for a really long time and talking about it for a really long time and who has had an inordinate amount of success. I, I've been unbelievably successful and that is luck and hard work and all of it. Well, I, I think you did a good job of like prefacing all the stuff I want to touch on here. Like, I think it's it's easy to see the polished version of Ezra and where you are today, right? Like, I first encountered you at like, I don't know, 2017 at Traffic and Conversion Summit. I, I think I told you this in person when I met you in, in San Antonio and we were playing poker. Um, I sat in front of a, a group of, of girls who literally every sentence you said, it was, oh, and I went, I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I'm gonna like this guy. Uh, I just thought the room was weird. Uh, and then I was like, wait, he knows we talked, your presentation was on point. And then, you know, I suffer from comparitis. So I was immediately like, oh, look where he is. Everybody I does. I knew you were younger than me. And I was like, oh man, how did he get here? And, and so for this podcast, I, I, I really wanted to like hear your story. How did you get where you are? Right. And so you breezed through a bunch of that stuff and it was a, a ton of my notes. Uh, but I'd love to know your journey because like you didn't just arrive here, right? Like it's been a long journey. I've heard you mention uh, all kinds of things from, you know, Johnny, how you doing? I hope to touch on uh, through some of like your, how you doing? my custom wigs and, and bar stools. Like I want to hear all this stuff. I, I want to know how you got where you are and like hear the journey and not just hear, you know, most podcasts I hear you on is tactical. It's right. You know, it's, it's three things to do. I'm X. good at teaching the technical tactical side of things showing exactly how to paint. This is what to do X, Y, Z, but we can go higher level than that. You know, the long story is I'm a grinder, man. I don't quit and I keep at it and I keep a positive attitude and I ask for help and I take the next step that I can take in the direction of my goals. And I show up every day and I do that. And I don't compromise my personal life and my relationship life and my physical body. Like I, I, I show up in every area of my life fully because I also know that's the best way to show up in my business, right? Like most entrepreneurs have, have this really hard time with setting container and boundary around their work life. And it just bleeds into every other part of their life. It's so hard too, because you have your cell phone on you all the time and you have your computer access, your computer, and you're so compelled by the cycle of, of, of your business. You love it the way that mothers love their children. They did this study where they, they, looked at the way the brain lights up when a kid, when a mom looks at her kid and when a business owner looks at their logo, it's like similar parts of the brain are lighting up, you know? So it's really hard to set that container and set that boundary around your work life. But if you don't do it and your work life just bleeds into every other part of your life and you don't make time for hobbies and you don't make time for your relationship and your family and you don't make time uh, for, you know, taking care of yourself and eating well and sleeping well, you end up burning out and your business fails anyways. So, um, so, so the, the short version is, I've kept at it, man. And I've, I've, I have not done it exclusively. I've kept at it and I've kept at the rest of my life as well. Yeah, I'd love to hear, I've heard you mention commune growing up on a commune. I've heard you mention it many, many times, like growing up in Hawaii, but I've never heard you really talk about it. Do you, do you care to touch on that? Yeah. Well, so, so I had an alternative lifestyle. Uh, I grew up in an alternative lifestyle experiment, also known as a commune, also known as an intentional community. Um, and is an interesting one because people think of communes and they think of like hippies and granola and farming and, you know, sex and crazy shit and guru cult leaders and like shit like that. You know, that's sort of like when you say you have to be careful what you say, because like words carry um, sort of meaning for people and commune doesn't always have a positive meaning. You know, this group of people that I grew up with was not a um you know, I say the difference between a commune and a cult, let's just start there. Cause people are like, Oh, you lived in a cult. Like, no dude, a cult is easy to join and hard to leave. A commune is hard to join and easy to leave. So just a little bit of a difference there. So the commune that I grew up on intentional community group of people got together in the sixties, you know, said, Hey, um, we're interested in exploring a different kind of living. And I can give you the whole history of how communes started. It's really fascinating. I don't want to go down that road, but it's really interesting how communes became a thing. Here's the interesting thing about communes, just high level. 1968-ish is when you started to see them spring up. Um, you fast forward to today of the 10,000 communes that sprung up between like 66 and 74, which was the real era of intentional communities popping up at that time. It's only about five left. And the place I grew up is one of them. And the reason that communes and intentional communities fail is you get a group of people together and it's very hard to uh, win at relating. So think about how hard it is to get two people to get along. Almost, almost no two people actually make it in their relationship. I mean, it's like what percentage of you don't forget about marriages, just relationships that happen before marriage. And then 
the marriage failure rate's got to be 60 some odd percent. Like people do not make it in relationship. They fail miserably most of the time. And that's because there's no education on how to win at relating. Things come up in relationship, jealousy, money, possessions, communication, sensuality, all this kind of shit. Man, woman dynamics, power dynamics, social dynamics. And um, the group I grew up with, they have uh, spent the last 50 years researching what does it take to have a winning relationship? Not necessarily a intimate relationship with a partner, but like, let's say a friendship, uh, yeah, intimate relationships too, but like re- relate all types of relationships. How do you succeed at them? And that's why when you heard me talking and you heard me saying, you had all the, I was saying shit that the women would be like, Oh, I've never heard that before. And people it's like, I have had access to this education on interpersonal communication and, uh, relationships that has really helped me in marketing because marketing is communication. I have the ability to see people and understand why they are taking the actions they're taking, what is motivating their behaviors. Because I grew up around a bunch of scientists basically who only studied that. And there were their own kind of crazy hippies, but like they were really good at that thing. You know what I mean? Um, So this place was wild that I grew up in, but I went to public school. You know, I had lived a normal life. It's just when I came home, I went home to a commune instead of a you know, house in the suburbs. So I had a little bit of, and it was, a, it was, it was interesting. And it was, and there was a lot, there was not a lot of structure and there was um, not a lot of oversight and there was crazy wild shit going on. Like it was cool. It, and you know, we didn't have a lot of money. Like it was a very interesting place to grow up, but you know what, when I think back on it, like I wasn't abused. Uh, I wasn't like, I, people have had it worse than I had it growing up. You know, people have had crazy, sexual abuse or people have crazy violent physical abuse or people, you know, grow up way more impoverished than, you know, we did in terms of, you know, Hey, the lights would go out or the power would go out or, you know, things it's like, we didn't have money, but it's like people have harder people, you know, people grew up with drug addict parents. Like there are people who have far more hardship than I experienced growing up. I didn't have a lot. And I was in a wild place that was sort of a little bit outside of traditional society, but I ultimately, you know, think I got, I had a real good, good deck of the cards. You know what I mean? Like I am not complaining at all. I'm very happy with the place I grew up and that group of people and what they're up to in the world. And I think it's really beautiful and awesome. So yes, there was some hardship in it, but it was ultimately a really good thing. So anyways, I grew up in this place. Um, I'm obviously failing. Like I mentioned before, failing out of school, can't make it in that environment, total fuck up in the eyes of the school system, labeled a dumb kid, but just couldn't, wasn't that I was stupid. It was just, I couldn't, fit into that. I don't know. I couldn't work within that constraint. Um, and then also didn't have anybody telling me I had to do homework or anything like that. So I didn't have any structure, um, which was fine, but, but anyways, so I'd poker became a, uh, popular thing around about 2001 with the ESPN and Chris moneymaker and full tilt and party poker. Uh, and I found this book called play poker like the pros by this guy, Phil Helmuth. And I got my mom to give me her credit card and I started playing limit poker on party poker. Um, and I crushed, man, I was super good. And I got myself a fake ID and I started playing at this card room called the California Grand Casino. And I would, uh, when I was like 16, I'd drive down there at 11 PM um, when Krispy Kreme was firing up its donuts. I'd get myself a 12 pack of Krispy Kreme when they were hot. I'd go to the casino, I'd play three, six, ultimately work my way to, you know, six, 12, 12, 24 limit all night long. And then I'd drive home about 5 AM when Krispy Kreme was firing their donuts again, <laughs> I had Krispy Kreme on the way there and back. Um, and, uh, so I was doing really good at that. And, and when I got out of high school, um, I failed out of junior college three semesters in a row. And I was like, you know what? I need to go, uh, to where there's a real poker scene because I think I can make a go at this. And that's when I moved to New York. I was 18 and, uh, played on the New York city underground for a couple of years. That's how I moved in with Cindy Joseph. She was a friend of my family. Um, and I met a guy who was a life coach And he was a life coach at a time before, you know, coaching was popular. So you had, you know, now you coaching is a mainstream concept. You have relationship coaches, health coaches, business coaches back, back in 04, 05, nobody knew about coaching. It wasn't mainstream, you know? Um, And what he was doing was he was selling digitally delivered information and actually big giant physical DVD packs. Um, People would type in make money online and stuff like that. He was using search engine optimization as a means to generate uh, visibility for his information offerings. He was selling books and CDs on how to start a life coaching business. And, uh, I was like, so wait a minute, you're making hundreds of thousand dollars a year working from your laptop. And I'm staying up all night with Joey Tutone and Bobby bag of donuts. Like we gotta, I, you have to teach me what you're doing. 
And so I started working for him in 05, learning search engine optimization and uh, landing page psychology and sales funnels and webinars and information publishing. And his model was very simple. He had an email list of people who wanted to become life coaches, about 150,000 people on his email list back in 06. Mind Valley, Vishen Lakiani, they were affiliates of his. He was the biggest dog in that space. Um, and he would put out a newsletter every month, every every week. And then once a month, he'd run a webinar launch to sell one of his programs. And, he's, and um, so I ended up taking over the marketing of his business from like 2006 to 2009 and running that, building it up to a million dollar a year business along the way. I I discovered a couple things, right? I also was, once I learned about SEO, I was all in. I bought every DVD. I was on every forum you could get into. I was like, realized internet marketing was a way that I could generate a lot of money, which was, I was really interested in back then from home and also could work for me when I wasn't there. I'd seen the light, you know, and I was like, I'm going to do this. Um, And, you know, his business model was cool, but Ultimately, what happened in 09 was he burned out and that business didn't work without him anymore because it was based on his persona. And so I built this business up to like a million dollar a year business, which is a lot of money for me back then. Of course, I didn't get to keep all that, but that's revenue. Uh, but I got some of it. And that when he burned out, I was like, man, these influencer based businesses are not the way to go. Well, 07, two years prior, I'd stumbled across dropshipping. The Wayfair guys, the um, Stompernet people were teaching it back then. Andy Jenkins, Brad Fallon were teaching dropshipping. Um and so I started a dropship retailer because I realized, man, we send people this information, but they don't consume it. So it's a great business, but only 5% of the people are actually reading the books we send them. Like, I want to send people something they use. Um, and I was working at this makeup shop. I'd quit poker. My wife didn't want me. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, uh, was like, dude, you can't be staying up all night with guys with guns and wads of cash. Like, you got to get out of this life. Guys were getting you, their hands chopped off. Like, Were you done before Black Friday? Like the the day George Bush shut down poker? Uh, yeah, long before. I, I was out of the life by 08. I think Black Friday happened in 2010 or 11 or something. Yeah, um, it, somewhere between 08. And 08. I just remember that day specifically of being... I was making money, right? And I was chasing money like you and uh, doing pretty well. On, uh, I was a more of a poker stars guy personally. And I remember that day vividly of like, oh, shit, I can't play this game anymore. And I, th- I thought. Yeah, man. When full tilt and party poker went down, luckily I was out of the life by then. But but I still hope they come back. I would still, if I if I could figure it out and it wasn't like only, I, there's this one called Poker Bros that my brother has, but it's only on your cell phone. It's like, I don't look at my cell phone. I need to figure out a way to play. I'd okay, like to yeah. play a sit and go here and there once a week, you know. Hit me up after um, we're done talking. I'll show you where to play. Yeah, I'm interested. It's pretty, it's pretty simple, um, yeah. Hook me up. But uh, uh, where was I? Basically transitioning from from selling informational to dropshipping products, which, look, as I was, I was doing a bunch of research for the show, I, I didn't even know you were a dropshipping guy, right? Like, um, that's that's where I came from. I, I, I made my hay in high-ticket dropshipping. I still build stores doing that. I also have, you know, sell uh, like supplements behind me here, but um, I had no idea that you, you came from the dropshipping world. And I, I talked to you about your past a little bit when I saw you, at, at, I don't even know where, um, and you were telling me about how you used to be an SEO junkie, but I had no idea that you were in dropshipping. Dude, as well. I started in the, the way I came up in the game was the way I really learned the ropes in e-commerce was SEO and Yahoo store dropshipping. So I would, I had, I started the wig website cause I was working at this makeup shop after I'd quit poker, I needed a square job. So I got a job. I looked on Craigslist. It was a job at the makeup shop in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. So I took it. Um, and this lady was selling, she was a special effects makeup. Uh, she was selling stuff like, you know, um, prosthetics and makeup and, you know, stuff that like now you, there's this show on uh, Bravo called Face Off where they make monsters for the movies. She was doing this all the way back in 05, like before it was like, she was doing it for the Broadway shows in New York City, you know? Um, and so I got a job with her. And one day she sold, uh, 15 Elvis wigs for like 800 bucks, something like that, like 150 bucks actually. Um, and I was like, damn, like if I could sell 15 Elvis wigs, I knew about selling stuff on the internet at that point. So if I could sell, if I could make $150, man, I'd be set. I do that once a week, once a month. Like I was like, that's crazy. So I found out where she was getting them. She was getting them from these Jewish dudes in Midtown. And you had these two Jewish dudes. You had Elliot and Mutal. Elliot was this big Hasidic dude uh, with the yarmulke and the payases. And uh, he would be sitting in this, giant midtown loft with just just a bag of apple pies little miniature apple pies you walk in he's just banging down apple pies and i'd be like yo elliot and i had i got the jewish connection because uh, i am as jewish as someone can get ethnically right like both of my grandparents are holocaust survivors both of my parents were raised super uh religious 
religiously J- Jewish, you know, they were a kosher, the whole thing. And then of course they went and became hippies. So I did not get the same level of, um, you know, Jewish tradition imposed on me, if you will, not that there's anything wrong. I'm all about, Hey, rock, rock and roll with religion, but I did not, I'm not a practicing Jewish religion person, but point is I'm all about, I, I identify as Jewish. So I'm definitely Jewish, but, uh, I had the bar mitzvah, the whole thing. But, um, my point is I had that, I understood that subculture of people. And I had the Yiddish language that my, like I just got these guys and I could speak to them in a way that if you didn't, you know, come from a super Jewish family, you wouldn't have that same ability to connect. You know what I mean? So I was like using that to my advantage in a positive way saying, Hey guys, like, let me sell these products on the internet. Let me give me, you know, you're selling to these stores. Let me sell them online. They were like, that's going to cost you $400,000 to make a website. It's like, dude, just give me the CD that has the products on it. And when I get an order, I will fax you. That's how you did it back then. And um, you can ship it out and I'll pay you for it. So they finally got them to give me this CD of wigs. Uh, I put all these wigs up. I, I learned to code RTML, which is the Yahoo store language. I put up the site, did my you know old school SEO, Squidoo lenses, hub pages, easy and articles, you know, on-site SEO, page rank sculpting, all that shit that we used to do back in the day to generate visibility to rank. Um, and I got the number one ranking costume wig website. Uh, in America. And I did something pretty clever, which is I would take these wigs that were like, I'd take a 1950s, a 19, an 1850s French King wig. And I would call it Kenny powers. You know, like I would use these wigs and I would, you know, if they looked like uh, something that someone was searching for, I would then take that and na- take that product and name it the, the search thing that people were looking for. So I would be ranking for all these queries and having products that actually looked exactly like that particular character, but maybe weren't manufactured to be like that character. So I had all this crazy long tail search volume and I became America's number one mullet wig, Afro wig, Elvis wig, troll wig retailer for all those years. It's crushing it, man. It was super cool. And when that started going well, I started doing all kinds of American drop shipping. So you'd go out and you'd find suppliers uh, you know, this, this business model, you'd find, you know, I had bar stools, gift baskets, sex toys, dog supplies, had everything. I was like basically a scaled down version of what Wayfair was. Wayfair had 400 stores, you know, exact match domains, grandfatherclocks.com they had. So I was using all the SEO strategy and I was pairing that with the logistics of connecting to American suppliers who wanted to sell items who didn't know anything about the internet and selling that online. And of course I screwed everything up and I, I had terrible customer service and I made money and didn't pay taxes and I didn't understand inventory. I fucked up everything you can fuck up. And, but at very low stakes. And, you know, one of the things that I think works to my benefit is I know that I'm not the smartest guy in the room and I understand what my strengths are. And my strengths have always been interpersonal communication, connection, uh, emotional intelligence is never, and enthusiasm and confidence and willingness to just put in the work. I have got strong willpower. I'm into willpower challenges. I will do whatever the thing is that we say we're going to do. I will actually do it. Like if we're not eating sugar, I won't eat the sugar. If we are going to run three miles a day for a month, whatever the thing that we have all decided, or I have decided within myself, I'm going to do. I'm really good at that. And I've been practicing. That's a skill you can practice. And I've been practicing that my whole life. So I'm, so I have those skills, but I'm not organized. I, um, you know, have a bunch of things that I'm really not great at but I'm willing to ask for help. I'm willing to look around and say, Hey, who knows how to do this? Or, Hey, you know, who would you go to if you had this issue? Or, Hey, I screwed up all my finances. Like who should I get as an advisor? Like I'm willing to, um, acknowledge my inadequacies and find people to support me in those areas. And so from a very early on in the, in my entrepreneurial career, I was looking for how I could get help. And so, um, Early on, I learned the art of systems and delegation and infrastructure and process and team. And I started practicing that. And frankly, if I had been better at that all the way back in 06, 07, 08, 09, I could have been Wayfair. Those guys just had un- do the same business model, but they understood systems and processes earlier than I did. You know, uh, IVG stores, there was a bunch of us running tons of drop shippers. Um, and my downfall in the dropshipping business was my lack of organization and understanding of systems, processes, infrastructure, and team. And so I could never scale that much because I was doing everything myself. My wife was doing it. And I was trying to work with, I just didn't understand business and process at the time. So um, that goes on for a while. And I realized there's a real deficiency in this business model, which is, so I'd figured out by this time that 
there's three things in business you have to do to succeed, in my humble opinion, which obviously is not very humble. Pe- uh, product. So you have to have good product, right? The thing that the person receives has to be good when they get it. If it's not, you're host. Um, support. So actually, you know, having people be able to get in touch with you, offering really good support, not keeping people's money when they want it back, the whole thing, right? And marketing. And that is being able to get people to know you exist and make the best promise so that the people will buy from you, right? So if you could get those three things down, you rock. Well, marketing at the time was very easy. It was search engine optimization. Support was very easy. It was email and phone. Product in dropshipping sucked because you didn't know what anyone had in stock. And so you'd sell something and then you'd fax the dropshipper and they wouldn't have it in stock because there were no systems of internet communication back then. And once they sent something out, you couldn't get the tracking number back from them. So it was like a nightmare. So I was like, man, I need to start white labeling or manufacturing my own stuff. And that's how in 2010, I started Boom, which is the same model I'd been running before. But in, And I started another skincare brand that was an Amazon brand that I've now sold. But it was the same dropshipping model, but now I controlled the supply chain. I had a third-party manufacturer to make my products. Um, of course, fast forward to 2012, Penguin, Panda, Hummingbird, 2013, the SEO world gets shut down. Um, so I take a big smack on the head because the only traffic source I really understood was SEO and Google AdWords. Um, and so once the SEO industry went under, I had to pivot to paid traffic. I made the pivot to paid traffic in 2012, and I've never looked back. And I literally run the same business model that I ran in 2007 today. It's an e-commerce business model. Uh, I'm running, I'm doing the same thing I've always been doing. Um, I'm just, you know, there's different traffic sources and different sales funnels and, you know, et cetera. So out of curiosity, what happened to my custom wigs and bar stools and all, all of those dropshipping sites you had? Did you, did you sell all of them? Did you just decide it was time to move on? I sold, um, my costume wigs for a quarter million bucks in 2012. Um, it's still operational today. Uh, it was a good deal for that guy. I sold bar stools for less. I sold, um, the dog supply store and the sec, a couple of the other stores I had got shut down, uh, could, could never recover from the, um, SEO uh, penalties. I was actually surprised that you were an SEO guy, right? So I've looked at Boom. There's not a whole lot of SEO going on over there. You, you talk a lot about paid ads and funnels and, and driving brand awareness, right? I would, I would bet a large chunk of your traffic is actually coming to the website. Um, but did you just kind of give up on SEO when, when you know, Penguin, Panda, Hummingbird, when all of that came along and shut down all of the, you know, blackish, grayish hat stuff? Like, did you? Yeah. The, so, so in my opinion, SEO now is very relevant for multi-skew retailers and not very relevant for few skew retailers, right? So for me, right, I have, if you look at my SEO and you actually look at my my title tags, my meta descriptions, my keyword density on my individual pages, my internal linking structure, my Google Webmaster tools, my site maps, and my blogging, I do SEO. But the issue is I've only got 15 SKUs And there's just not a lot of search volume that's relevant to my market. Makeup for older women, pro-age cosmetics. Like there's just not a ton of search volume out there. And so it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to do anything other than the basics, which is pick your main 50 keywords, make sure you've optimized your on-site, you know, your on-site stuff, do your internal linking structure, and then put out good high quality content regularly. Some of which is optimized for longer tail queries that are relevant to the brand. There's not a lot more for me to do than that. That is worth my while. So I don't really do it. Now, Smart Marketer and Zipify is a whole different story. I got a whole SEO strategy over there um, because those brands have thousands and thousands of query, queries that are relevant to getting um, you know, organic search traffic for people who are in the market or searching for those types of products. So doing my research, uh, you know, I, I stumbled across my cost- costume. Is it costume or custom wigs? My costume wigs. And I think actually the... I think they're now only on Amazon. I think they finally, like last month, shut down the uh, Yahoo store. Oh, no, looks like, nope, they're back up. Yahoo store is back live. Take it back. I'm still on there. If you look at all the still pictures. Still a Yahoo me. store. Shut up. I'm going to pull this up now. Yeah, bro. If you go there on the, on, the, on the homepage, you'll see the live chat is a picture of my wife. The mullet wigs picture is me. Um, it's the same Yahoo store I sold them. I coded this theme that you're looking at. I coded this whole store by, by scratch from, uh, from hand, by hand from scratch. Um, they're still using all my same pictures. If you go to why buy from us, there's a picture, there's a video of me at like 18 years old. They've literally, they didn't change anything, bro. They just bought this site and ran it off the SEO. I had good SEO on this site. 
That's amazing that it's still like that's literally you know, like a younger. It kind of looks like your brother in that uh, in that video. That's hilarious. Yeah, there you go, dude. I was doing wow. the damn thing all the way that's back amazing. in 07, bro. <laughs> Look, they have the same Johnson box that I put in in 08 at the top of the uh, Why Buy From Us page. That's hilarious, bro. Wow. I remember being so stoked when I figured out how to like do nested menus and all that kind of stuff. So I yeah, came in and, like at the beginning of shop. I couldn't be happier that I did either. Like looking back at some oh of these God. stores, they're horrendous. Yeah. But back in the day, this was like cutting edge technology, bro. I'm going to dig around this website later today. That's amazing. I had no idea that it was still the same exact thing from 2013. Look, so upon doing the research again, I didn't know you were the drop shipping guy. So I, I stumbled across the brown box formula. Like I had no idea that you actually like had a course teaching people how to get started. In fact, I've talked to you like, one of, the, one of the times I talked to you in person was like, how, how difficult is it to get people to complete your course? And you said, look, I don't, I don't teach beginners anymore. I teach winners to win more, basically, is what you said. Um, and so, so what happened to the brown box formula? Yeah. So, so first of all, I never set out to be uh, the guy in e-commerce. I was just a guy who, you know, blogging was popular and I liked what I was doing and I wanted to talk about it. And so I did. And then people started being interested and I was like, well, if people are interested, I'll keep doing it. But it was never like I set out to create a business. I never wanted the David Wood business model of teaching courses. That was never my plan. I was always behind the scenes, man. I was never going to be the front of house guy. I was running David's event behind the scenes. He's always like, you could be a speaker. You could be a teacher. I was like, nah, bro, I'm not that guy. I'm Mr. Technical guy who's behind the scenes, who wants to build things and be left alone. I'm a hermit, you know? Um, but I started doing it and it felt really good that it was helping people. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do more of this. And then what happens is the more you do something, the more you fall in love with it. So it sort of happens. And so, so I got approached. I had been blogging for years and I'd done some courses for Shopify and stuff like that all the way back. And in 2012, digital marketer approached me and they said, Hey, we want to publish a course of you teaching people how to do what you do. And I was like, ah, I don't want to do that. Uh, they worked on me for like a year. 2013, I created the brown box formula, which was how to start uh, drop ship SEO retailers doing exactly what I did. Uh, I think we sold thousands of them. Uh, I put people on big commerce because Shopify wasn't big yet. I coded it. I was big commerce's number one affiliate, put out the brown box formula. A lot of people had a lot of success with it. Um, it was great. I really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. And I also realized that already at that point, I was a more effective person if you already had something built. I was the, like, if you had something built, I could help you scale it. I could teach you systems, processes, traffic funnels, optimization. I could teach you a lot more than if I was just trying to help you get started and pick a product. Uh, and people would get really stuck picking the product and way less people were being successful starting something than optimizing something they already had. And then Hummingbird, Penguin, Panda, the whole thing hit. And it was a lot harder to get started with less money because with SEO, you didn't need a lot of money. Um, and then it was like, Helping people pick products was really, it was just like, I found it difficult doing the customer support and helping people get started. And so after the brown box formula, I went to digital market and I said, Hey, if I'm going to do anything else for you, I want to just help people who already have a business. I don't want to be the guy you come to, to start a business. And the other thing about business opportunity is it gets a really bad rap, right? Like everybody, like all these drop shit, you know, make a million dollars drop shipping overnight. You got all these guys in Lambos and ripped jeans and like just the, the scammy internet marketer that you see in your mind is somebody who's selling you a business opportunity. There's not that there aren't good business opportunities out there. Like the folks over at amazing.com, they teach a business opportunity on how to get started on Amazon. That's a great business opportunity program. But a lot of the business opportunity programs that out that are out there are just bullshit, get rich quick schemes. And I didn't want to be lumped into that. I just could see that's not the, I didn't want that um, uh, perception. I didn't want to be the guy who taught people how to get started. And so when I, when I started 20, Smart Marketer in earnest, which was after the Brown Box Formula launch, I focused on, if you have an e-commerce brand, come to me and I'll help you make it better. I just wanted that as my, um, I felt like I could be the most effective and the most helpful in that regard. There was already, you know, digital marketer was if you have an information brand or you're a speaker, a coach or an author, come to us. And there was already a ton of people teaching biz op. And I was like, I'm going to just be the guy you want to come to if you have an e-commerce brand that you want to do better. Um, and so I just put out a blog and I started blogging about that and I got a bunch of people to join the newsletter. And then I never wanted to sell courses beyond the thing I did with digital marketers, like a one-time thing. So I started a mastermind. Cause like, I want a community of people who are, are running e-commerce businesses that I can relate with and network with and help. And we can all share strategies and ideas. Like I want a community of only e-commerce business owners. I started this thing called the blue ribbon mastermind. I still run it to this day. Uh, that was the first thing I sold at smart marketer. 
And then um, eventually I was doing really well on Facebook and everyone was asking for my Facebook strategy. So I put out a Facebook course. I started teaching courses and I was having fun with it and it was good. I started doing events and I kind of just began running the David Wood life coaching business model, but in e-commerce, same business model, put out a newsletter every now and again, offer someone a course you got or an event you got or a coaching program you got. And that was really cool um, and enjoyable until about 2017 when my e-commerce businesses and my software businesses got so big and so successful that I wasn't having time to teach courses anymore. So I still would do the blogging and the podcasting, but I wasn't having I wasn't making new stuff to sell the community. And so I realized if if this thing's going to ever be anything beyond the Ezra Firestone show, it needs somebody who can run it and be the main teacher and put a vision in place for it. And so I found Molly Pittman, who was working at Digital Marketer and had left there. uh, And she sort of became the lead educator, course creator, you know, CEO. She's the CEO of that brand now. And she's running that company. And I'm sort of the financer and the strategist and more behind the scenes. I do some content, but I just didn't have the energy or time to teach courses anymore. So I kind of stepped back from that now. You had others helping there too, right? Like you had Brett Curry teaching yeah. your Google side and the YouTube side. Yeah. Brett Curry's there, Ari Baga, Laura. There, I got a bunch of educators. The point is to like have that be a platform where you can come and learn the basics of digital, digital marketing and also the advanced tactics of digital marketing. And, you know, I had such a good base there, you know, I had hundreds of thousands of subscribers, a lot of notoriety. It's like, it didn't make sense to shut that down, but also I didn't have the energy to keep doing it. And I'm very clear about, I want to go deep, not wide, and I'm not going to compromise my personal life just because there's more money potentially to be made. And my biggest, I mean, at the end of the day, I also want to make money so that I can take care of the 60 hippies who raised me. You know, I got 60 hippies to support. I got a bunch of stuff I need money for. And so Boom and Zipify are my two best money-making opportunities by a mile. Way better than Smart Marketer. Smart Marketer is only as good as the next month's revenue. It can never be sold. It's not an asset. Um, So I I had to choose, you know? Well, you know, just to touch on Smart Marketer, like I've taken some of your courses. They're fantastic over there. Uh, my friend Troy speaks extremely highly of, of, of your mastermind as well. And I, I've certainly heard a few other people. Leanna Patch mentioned it a few times to me as well. Uh, so I can't speak highly. And obviously, you're doing something good over there. But it, it's interesting to go from the guy teaching this stuff. Look, uh, I've put off creating a course for a very long time because I was worried. Like a lot of the things you mentioned there, number one, people don't finish courses. So that sucks. Like 5% of the people who take it might actually build something that's frustrating. Uh, and then, you know, helping people choose their market or their niche or whatever. It's all frustrating. And so I, I totally understand, but I, I didn't even know you had that in the first place. I thought you just started with helping people get more. So when well, I stumbled, that means it's working. I don't want to be known as that guy. You know, it was, it was a good time. And I helped a lot. You know, there's a lot of people who are successful who took it. And also, you know, it's not like it's, it's not like it's, um, it's not something I want to necessarily be known for the guy who used to teach people how to drop ship. I'm happy. I'm, I'm not, I'm proud of that part of my life. You know, I'm not, I'm not ashamed of that. I did, I did, a, I created a good course in it. And, and also just like any business opportunity, you'll have a hundred people buy it and three will actually be successful. And that's just the number two, even in terms of just people who start businesses, you know? And so, I felt really good because I knew that what I put out was good and that if you really did it, you could be successful. If you pick the right market and you work the system, you had just as good a shot at success with my business opportunity programs, anything else there out there, if not more. And so I felt good about it. And also I just didn't love the idea that most people were going to fail with this thing, you know? And then there, so, well, then someone hipped me to the framing of, Hey, you know, that helped people on their journey. And maybe they weren't successful with your course. Maybe they just learned the basics. And then the next thing they did. So it's like, oh, it's like, okay, if they don't end up with a successful business out of this thing, I have not failed them, you know? But I just, I don't know. I had a hard time with how many people would buy this thing and and ultimately not end up with successful businesses, which was the promise we were making is if you actually do this, you'll have a successful business, but then people won't do it. Or, the, you know, it's like, becomes a whole thing. Well, speaking of sketchy SEO, the only thing I was trying to research it and see what what's actually in this course or like find a copy. All I could find was like uh, brown box formula dash review as refire stuff, just like all keyword optimized titles, just trying to hit review of somebody in the, with like an affiliate link to broken pages. And uh, it was interesting. I, I couldn't find anything on it. So I knew I had to bring it up today and just ask you about it. Uh, so you yeah, mentioned it was good. It was good. It was good back then. People <laughs> liked it. 
you mentioned Cindy Joseph that she was like a family friend. Like, th- that was my next note. I was just curious. How did Boom actually start? Right, like it. It's called Boom by Cindy Joseph, and I know she's she's passed away. And I, you know, if you want to touch yeah. on that, that's okay. Uh, well, you I, know this this intentional community that I grew up on. Uh, my parents and these folks. One of the ways they supported themselves was teaching courses on things like communication to folks who were interested. So so they were never a like evangelistic organization. They weren't out trying to make money. They weren't out trying to say we exist and buy from us and this is our stuff and you should learn this stuff. But word got around that there there was this place where that you could go and take relationship courses and marriage counseling courses that really worked, you know? Um, and so it's like one of those word of mouth type deals where tons of people find out about it because it's actually really good stuff. And then every now and again, they would teach a course. And so Cindy was just happened to be someone who would come take these courses, you know? So when I was like 13, 14, 15, Cindy would be coming to my house to take like a course on communication or a course on relationships or whatever. And I became buddies with her and I'd ask her about New York and she was a famous fashion model. And I'd be like, what's that like, you know? And we became friends. And then when I uh, was wanting to move to, to go play poker for a living, I looked up on the forums, like where had the underground scene? And New York was one of the prominent places in America that had an underground poker scene. So I called her up and said, Hey, I want to live with you and play poker out there in New York. And she's like 400 bucks a month. You can rent a room in my house. So 2005, I moved to Yonkers, New York, about 40 minutes outside the city, rented a room from Cindy Joseph and started playing, playing on the New York city underground. And also as you, you know, like, as you just heard, found my way into e-commerce and stuff. And when I decided it was 08 by 08, I was a year into the wig business. I'd realized all the fallacies of drop shipping, all the downsides of them, of it. And I was like, man, I need to make my own products. So I went to Cindy. I said, Hey, you were a makeup artist. Now you're a fashion model. Why don't we make a cosmetic brand with you as the face of it? We can do the David Wood model. You'd be the face. You and I have this shared vocabulary about, you know, what it's like to be an aging woman in society. This idea that women's value is based on youth and beauty and that society tells them that it's pretty good until about 35, then it goes downhill. And that's what you had all the women at that speech humming and hawing about. All that content comes from the place I grew up. It's just they understand the way in which society perceives, like for us as men, the way we're valued is based on our production. The more money we make, the more value we have in the eyes of society. This is obviously not a reflection of a person's true value, but like, so I understood all these things about, or at least I had a shared vocabulary with her. And I was like, nobody's going to listen to me talking about what it's like to be an aging woman, but like you could be the face of this brand. And we could talk to this group of people about this experience that they're having of aging. And we could have products that are related to that. We could run this whole e-commerce model. We could combine the information model and the e-commerce model, and we could have our own products. So she set out formulating and by 2010, we had a product and we launched and I ran all the tech, all the marketing, all the blogging, all the content strategy, all the advertising, all the SEO. I'd have her do videos and develop products. And we just rocked from there, you know, and we had a, we were really good buddies and good friends and we had a good collaboration energy and uh, ultimately it worked really well, you know. Do you start off and, with and, like- and, and it, Listen, we failed for five years, you know, she ran the finances, took us- four years before we made a hundred thousand dollars in a year. So 2014 was our first hundred thousand dollar year. And by the end of 2014, she was burned out and we didn't have any money because she was running the finances bad. Um, and so 2014, she said, I want out. I said, great, give me the company. I'll take it over. You sit back and, uh, collect checks. And I took over in 2015 and I funded the growth from the money I had from the wig business sale. And 2015, we did 3 million, 2016, we did 16 million. So when I took over fully, we really started to scale. Um, but, you, but def- you know, can you, but- can you dive in right on that spot right there? Like what did, what did you change when you took over that, that made this explode? So while Cindy and I were running the company together, I was running tons of other e-commerce businesses. I had a services agency doing, uh, you know, WordPress development, Magento development, X cart shop site, Volusion. So I was doing e-commerce development, which leads into how I became a software person, which I'll tell about, tell you about if we have time, but, um, I was, uh, doing pay-per-click. Uh, Google AdWords pay per click, you know, for for tons of I had to make it about a million bucks a year doing that. I was running all kinds of businesses. I was hustling, man, grinding. It was great. And uh, when and and boom was awesome and it was fun, but it wasn't being that successful. Uh, and Cindy and I were sort of um, we both wanted to be the star of the show. And so the power dynamic was always we could never agree on stuff. When we were we all we would always get there, but we but we there was a lot of um, it took a lot to, to move anything forward because there was a lot of communication that had to happen for us to agree on what the, the next move was. Um, and so it just wasn't worth it to me to really invest in that brand 
besides I, I knew it could be good. And I knew, you know, I had, I always knew it was, it could be something special. And I had a bunch of other stuff that was working and the dynamic there was, it was just harder to move the ball forward. So we just, you know, just trotted along when I took over fully. Um, I didn't, you know, cause Cindy was, it was an advertising thing. She didn't want to advertise. She didn't want to say certain things. She didn't want to be pushy. And I was like, look, we got to tell people we exist. We got to like try to promote. So we had this like, you know, advertising was a hot button topic for us. When I took over, um, you know, Facebook was starting to come around as a real medium. This is 20 end of 2014. And, and Facebook was like starting to really become a hot traffic source. And before that, we were really only running search traffic. And like I said, there's not a lot of search traffic for our brand, you know, but, but video ads to women who are experiencing the process of aging, talking to them about that experience and telling them this new idea and philosophy around it, and then leading into a conversation about products. Well, that is what Facebook was made for multi, multi data point contextual targeting. So once uh, I started leveraging multi data point contextual targeting, which was Facebook really in earnest and putting money behind it and optimizing the story and the ads, we started doing well right away because it was really compelling and it was unique and nobody else was saying this stuff. We were the first people to say pro age. We were the first people to talk about this. Uh, and we really just hit a, hit a, hit a moment in the zeitgeist. We hit a, just the right message to the right market at the right time with the right visibility source. Um, and also I, at that point now think about this 2014, I'm seven years into business. I understand support. I understand structure. I understand systems. I understand scale. I understand delegation. I understand processes. I understand finance and, you know, inventory carry and how to read a P and L. And I just, I was ready, you know, I was ready and I had the skills that you would need so that when something does take off, it, you, it doesn't sink. Most of the time things take off and it breaks people, it breaks the company. It breaks the supply chain. It breaks the finances. They go into debt. Like I was ready to scale at that point. Cause I've been running companies for seven years by then. And so it was sort of the perfect storm of my own ability as an entrepreneur to handle an influx of volume and success and the right time with that product and the right visibility source. And I just hit it all perfect storm. Well, partnerships are the hardest ship to steer, right? And so was there, when you took over and, and then <laughs> exploded it, was there resentment there with her as you know a smaller partner? Oh, now no, that- she was stoked. She still had her ownership equity and she still got her salary. And she, st- she just stepped back and went to really focus on her relationship and really deliberately chose, I'm ready to, I've been, she was 56 at the time or something. She's like, I'm ready for a break. I'm going to just step back. She kept her equity. She kept everything. I just got full control of the company and she was on board with that. And once she saw it doing well, she was like, great, keep doing it. You know? Um, so there was no, there was no, um, we didn't have any of that battle anymore because she was really ready to let go of the reins, you know? So you've got Boom by Cindy Joseph, you've got Smart Marketer with courses and a Blue Ribbon Mastermind, and then currently you have Zipify, Page Builder, and One Click Upsell. What was the order there? Like, what was the process? I know you mentioned you you started blogging at, at somewhere. You didn't really mention the name of it, and then it, that turned into Smart Marketer right around the same time Boom started, uh, and you you sold the Mastermind first. Well, Boom was Boom was three years before Smart Marketer. So I was an e-commerce merchant, a service, uh, uh, an AdWords services agency a uh, development agency, a coach and consultant, uh, and an affiliate marketer, you know, um, from like 05 to 2010 when Boom started. So those five years I was doing all that stuff. And I, I was still running the agency, obviously, while Boom was going uh, because that's how I was really making my money. Um, and I was running the dropship, dropship stores also while Boom was going, before Boom was successful. 2012, 13, that's smart marketer, brown box formulas, that business model kicks off. Um, 2012 sold the dropship businesses, 2013 sold the rest of them. Um, and I didn't actually shut down my development agency until, till 2014, when end of 2014, when I took over boom, when I took over boom, I knew I was like, I know this is good. I know I can be successful with it. So I shut down my development agency, which by the way, I failed at failed at that. I'll tell you about that real quick. Uh, I sold a lot of services. I was a successful marketer and I was successful with customer support. I failed at the financial side of being an agency person because I didn't understand how to set boundaries. And so I'd sell someone something like a $20,000 Magento build. And then they would just keep asking me for stuff and I would just keep doing it. You know, with an agency, you're buying and selling labor. That's the business model. You're buying labor for one price and you're selling it for another and you're doing support. Um, And so if it's a project basis, which is everything I was doing and you don't have a clear boundary of when the thing ends, you're buying labor 
and you sell it for a certain amount. And then eventually the labor that you're buying overtakes the amount you sold it for. And I, and I realized later in life that I had an issue with boundaries in general, which is kind of how it works of, of not knowing what mine were and how to set them and say, you know, I had to learn this through my relationship with my wife of like how to set boundaries and what actually feels good to me and how to like deal with communication and boundaries, which by the way, is the fundamental thing in communication, but it's how it goes, you know, so you have whatever blockages you have. And so because I didn't have good boundaries, I couldn't ever say no to somebody who wanted something from me. And so I, I sold millions of dollars in development, but I didn't make any money, you know, sold millions of dollars in AdWords services, but I didn't make any money because ultimately I was not, I didn't understand the finances of it and I didn't have good boundary settings. So, so anyways, I shut the agency down. I was, I was maybe making a tiny bit, but I was definitely not making as much as you should. Um, if you're running that business. So, but I've been an e-commerce merchant, right? For seven years by, tw- by the end of 2014. And I'd been a developer. I understood the e-commerce sales cycle and I understood all the technology and what the things that the technology had or didn't have. I understood the difference between X, X cart and Zen cart and Volusion and Magento and big commerce and Yahoo store and OS commerce and WooCommerce. And I had been living in that world been building stores for people. I am a shitty developer. Okay. But I know enough. And I was hiring developers as the, you know, I was using outsourced dev, but I can speak the language well enough, taught myself well enough to understand how to tell them what I needed, how to understand what language it needed to be built in. And then most importantly, how to help the client understand what they needed for their specific project. So I could bridge the gap between a client and a developer at the time because I understood what they needed because I was a merchant myself. And so, okay, so fast forward to Boom's doing really well, right? I take over 2014, uh, end of 2014, 2015, we make 3 million bucks. Um, well, I'm on Shopify by this point and I'm starting to see a bunch of the holes in Shopify. And I'm like, shit, man, Shopify's page building sucks ass. Shopify does not have a way to do good upsells, cross sell. I understand the e-commerce sales cycle because I've been a merchant forever. And I understand the technology really well because I've been doing it for a long time. And I see the holes in the tech and I see where there's openings that I need for my own store. Um, And I thought, you know, the reason I failed at agency was because I didn't understand boundaries, but there's a better business model than project-based development, which is subscription development, also known as software as a service. And I thought, man, I can just repurpose all this understanding that I have and I need to build all this stuff for my own website. So I can build it for my own website and then I can open source it to other people in the Shopify community. By the way, by that time, I was already the lead educator for Shopify's e-commerce university. So I had a real way to get in front of Shopify merchants Um, and I can charge people a monthly fee. And so I I started development um, on Zipify pages and one click upsell in uh, 2015 and the 20 in early 2015, um, by 2016, I'd launched and, um, you know, they were not the greatest apps back then. They were, they were clunky and bulky, um, but they were very useful for people on Shopify. And so, uh, and by the way, software is the hardest business model I've ever done. I would never recommend it to anybody. It's a nightmare. Um, it's a never ending rabbit hole of madness, you know, cause you basically, when you talk about marketing product and support, well, with, e-commerce, you got, you know, physical objects. So more, you know, I I sell tubs with goop in them. As I scale, it's more tubs, more labels, more goop, really good goop, but it's like simple support is very simple because it's questions about refunds and stuff and product. And then marketing is the same difficulty for any business. You got to tell stories. You got to, you know, engage people in conversation. You got to get them to say, yes, you got to upsell and cross. So you can do all the same stuff you got to do. So with software, the product is changing every day. You're adding stuff to it. You're changing stuff. It's also talking to other products, other code bases that are changing. So you need front-end engineers, back-end engineers, QAs, project managers, UX designers. You know, you, you just need crazy amount of the, the, the product itself is staff salary. That's the overhead. That's the cost of goods. The cost of goods is cost of development. Um, and then the support, the agents who are supporting the business owners have to be smarter than the business owners using the app with the technology. So the support has to be super high level and shit's always breaking and it's always chaos. And then, oh, and by the way, there's only a million people in the world who could even be interested in it, who are on Shopify. So you're who you're marketing to is like that big. So it's a very hard model. Um, But 
software also has the upside of there's always problems to solve, which I like. I like these projects that have endless amounts of shit to do. I like that. I'm like, oh, good. I'm going to focus my energy on that and go solve problems. I love the idea of building things that help people with their brands. Um, and they're the, it's the most valuable business you can build. Softwares trade at a multiple of revenue. E-commerce businesses trade at a multiple of profit. You know, e-commerce business does 5 million a year. Let's say it makes a million bucks a year in profit. It's going to sell for a three to six X that profit. A software business has to make a million dollars a year in revenue to sell for that three, same three to six X. So a software business is arguably, you know, five to, let's say four to 10 times as valuable as an e-commerce business as an asset. It's the most valuable asset you could build. Um, and so for that reason, I really like it also, but, it, but it's a lot of fun and I enjoy it. And so that's how I got into that. And I've been now, you know, I almost went bankrupt with that. I almost really, that was like the software business almost sank me. I can tell you that story if you're interested, but you know, I, I thought like, I'm a business owner. I know how to run business at this point. I'm running a multi-million dollar, several multi-billion dollar, million dollar e-commerce businesses. Um, but you don't realize how difficult software is and how much overhead it requires before you have a product. I'd spent about half a million bucks before I had anything to sell. And I was spending all of my money that I was pulling from my businesses on building this software. Um, and uh, I almost didn't get it off the ground. And I really understand why software businesses take on investment capital because how much, because, you, you know, as you scale an e-commerce business, your overhead scales with you, you know, you maybe hire customer support and then you maybe need a little bit more inventory carry. Well, with software, the overhead of running it is from all the way before you've even built it. Cause you need the same team. Of course you add people over time, but like the team that you need to run it is the team that you need to build it. So you're, you're paying for your cost of goods for a year before you ever sold anything. You know what I mean? It's really hard. There's gotta be some positive to it as well, right? Like in, in e-commerce, you, you want to have a great product, but that's usually just the first iteration of the great product you're going to have in the future. Right. And so it takes time to sell the first batch of product, get feedback, send it to your supplier, test new products, bring it to market. And and by the time you get to your third iteration, you're three to five years down the road where SAS, you're constantly iterating and, and just selling the same thing over and over again. Yeah. You're constantly making it better. You're constantly adding stuff, but there's also constantly competitors popping up who are doing new shit, different shit. There's constantly, it's like, it's, it's, it's a rough model, dude, but it's so fun because you're con because, because of that reason, because there's always new stuff to add. There's always new integrations. There's always things changing. Um, but you also run into the issue of like, you know, you built your hand, your, you know, the way Amazon brands built their house on Amazon's land, Amazon can kick them out at any time. Same deal. You piss Shopify off and you're gone. So it's like, you have this one, one, uh, you, you're at the whim of Shopify. Shopify might decide to build your feature in native. They've done that to apps, you know? So like it is a bit of pr precarious as well, but, um, but I really like it. What's wild with the two you chose is like you had this need in 2015 and they basically don't exist on Shopify still to this day. Like pages every or sections everywhere was going to come for a while, right? Like it's still not there. And like, so you still basically need a page builder unless you're pretty good at coding. Um, and there's no option for one click ups. Heck, there's still not for some folks like me who's using Stripe. Um, and until they make full integrations, I can't use. Refers we have it now. Yeah, we have we have a uh, uh, shop pay and Stripe uh, works with the Shopify native upsell checkout now. So basically Shopify native checkout. If you're, if you're, are you on Shopify payments? No, I'm, I'm using Stripe. Stripe as your, as, as my payment provider. Like, so, uh, one of these dog products back here has hyaluronic acid in, which I'm sure you run into in your, in your face creams as well. Um, and apparently that was against Shopify's terms. So I was kicked off Shopify payments who uses Stripe to go use Stripe directly. Uh, and so now that they've been making this adjustment, um, to, you know, their back end uh, in the last six months or 12 months or whatever, like uh, I wasn't able to, like, I wasn't grandfathered in on, on some of the products and I can't adjust until they bring you guys in natively. So been you haven't been grandfathered into OCU. I, w I didn't sign up for it before they started this transition to make everything native. Uh, and so during this transition, they're not allowing any, anyone new to sign up unless you're on Shopify payments. I see. Damn. Let me, uh, Send me a DM. See if I can do something about that. I, I um, like the sound of that. Yeah. What a guy. But yeah, I mean, I, and I'm working on an SMS app now. That's my next app. So, so, so software business model, by the way, I chose a, the, the worst one you can choose first. Then I did a pretty good one. Now I'm going to do the best one. So worst business model in software is pay me X amount every month and I will 
keep making this thing better for you. It works fine. I like it. You know, pay me 67 bucks a month for Zipify pages and I will improve this product every day, every week, every month for the rest of the time that you're a member. I'll just keep making it better. One click upsell was pay me X amount per month. And then based on what I make you, pay me a little bit more. So if my app's crushing it for you, then you give me a little bit extra. So that's pretty good because it's like pay me a fee and then based on the performance, pay me a little bit extra. Um, the way Clavio does it is much smarter. It's like, hey, you use this thing. As much as you use it, that's what you pay us for. We don't going to track how well you do. It's like, we don't care. Just you could pay for usage. And that's the best software business model is let people pay for using it. Now, of course, that coincides with if they're being successful, they keep using it more and more. So you as the software developers are incentivized to make sure they're being successful. Obviously, that's what you want. Um, and that's my next app is, is that model. It's SMS app. I heard you mention that. Um, man, it's been a while now. I, I don't even remember the name. You mentioned it with your, you call him Tech Nasty, uh, Kurt Elster. Tech Nasty, <laughs> Kurt Elster. Yeah, yeah, the big dog. Uh, it's called Connect, K-I-N-N-E-K-T. Connect. It's sort of, I guess you could look at it as like, um, you know, similar to PostScript or Attentive or SMS Bump, but it's got my little flavor on it and some stuff I do. Uh, and uh, it's in beta. So K, it's not in the app store yet, um, but it, it will be. Do you have any plans to do any SaaS above and beyond? I mean, basically those two? I think Zipify and Connect will be my only SaaS plays. I might buy a piece of software at some point. So the next phase of my career, once I sell Zipify and uh, sell Boom, is more a private equity model where I am buying brands uh, or software companies and um, leaving the leadership and teams in place and providing financial support and strategic guidance and taking majority ownership. Uh, and I think that is a better model for me than being the um, day-to-day CEO. I think my days as a, I am the CEO running this company daily in the trenches. Once I'm done with these cycles that I'm in, I'm probably out of that because I will have enough money at this point where I don't need to do that. And, um, be more of the investor advisor slash owner of many brands um, and, you know, empowering and supporting teams in scaling their brands uh, and having majority ownership. So, so I think that's my plan. I really like that model. I think it's a very smart model. I think from a wealth creation standpoint, it's the best uh, model that you can run, which is, you know, build or buy assets, grow them in value and then sell them because wealth creation comes from asset liquidation. That's it. It doesn't come from cash flow businesses. It comes from the sale of assets. You know, buy real estate, let the real estate appreciate, sell it, whatever, whatever your version of asset uh, creation or purchase is, and then appreciation of those assets and then liquidation. That's that's the model uh, to generate real wealth. And I'm interested in that. And so, you know, I've been, I'm a really good builder and I'm a really good operator and I'm starting to become a good buyer, advisor, and financer. I've heard you mention, you know, speaking of wealth, I heard you mention you need a hundred million liquid, but I've never heard you explain. Million liquid, baby. I've, I've never heard you explain why that is a lot of money to have liquid uh, and not, you know, working for you somewhere. And so I'm genuinely curious, what what is 100 million liquid mean? Why that number? Well, it's a hundred million liquid from, you know, I'd say I'm already 25% of the way there and I've spent a lot of that. So hundred million liquid total, right? Um, and I've been working towards that for a while now. And I've got, you know, I've got a lot of things that I um, need money for. So uh, I, you know, probably need 20 to 30 million for what I'm doing here in New York, um, ultimately for what I want to do. Um, I probably need, let's say, 10 to 20 for uh, taking care of the folks that that raised me. Um, I, you know, want a solid uh, 20 to 30 for philanthropic purposes. And then I want, you know, 20 to 30 for messing around in business. So, so I've got, you know, a personal vision around my own family community and what I want to create, uh, in my world that is tens of millions. It's going to cost tens of millions of dollars to do what I want to do. And then I've got philanthropy based, um, endeavors that I'm interested in supporting that are going to cost tens of millions of dollars. And then I also want tens of millions to play around in business. So, so about a hundred, hundred million has always been the number of, of what I need liquid. And, you know, you don't get the, and, and that might seem mind boggling to some people and I, or seem like arrogant or whatever, but like, Hey, I started, I've gone every level. You know, I started when I remember when I was working at the yoga shop at a $33,000 a year salary, struggling to pay my rent and eating ramen noodles in a Chinatown apartment 
and thinking, man, I, if I could just make 10 grand a month, I would be really, I'd be so rich. I'd really have it together. And wealth works that way where um, every level you jump, you can sort of see a little bit bigger of a vision and figure out how to hold a little bit bigger vision. And I'm not sort of saying that the goal of generating mass amounts of wealth is any kind of a righteous goal or that anyone should have it. Um, so, but it is, it is one that I have and that I see a way in which to approach in a good way, in a positive way. And I see things I want to do in the world that can, that having access to that kind of resource would be really handy for. I'm happy. I love my life. I love what I'm doing. I bought my land. I paid off my house. I'm good, dude. I made it. And I'm every day I wake up grateful and, uh, you know, appreciative of the ride that I've had and all the hardships I've had. And, you know, it's not like if I don't get that, get to that point, I have somehow failed. So like, I'm, dude, I'm, I made it. And also I'm, I've always been a big dreamer and I've always seen I just, one of the skills I have is I'm willing to put it out there and say, this is what I want to do and go for it. And yeah, you know, hope it works out. Well, I, I just heard you mention that number and I was trying to wrap my head around. I'm, I'm sitting here trying to crunch numbers and I'm like, hold, is he like going to run this commune? Like he has to take care of all these people or it, it, it makes sense that you want to do a lot of different things. And like, can you touch on the, the, the philanthropic efforts at all? Like, are you planning on, on building businesses that, that, uh, you know, work two ways and are giving back and, and are also making a profit? Or are you planning on just straight? Yeah, I have a 501c3 and at a high level, it sort of redistributes surplus goods to people in need. Um, and you know, I believe in a lot of um, uh, sustainability initiatives, like with the oceans and with the rainforests and, um, you know, with the waters and with lands. Um, so I've got a lot I want to do in that area. And with my philanthropy, I, it's like one of those things where I don't really, like a lot of people really advertise and show off and talk all about what they're doing and take a lot of credit for it and all that. And I think that's, I'm not judging that style. I don't, I don't think that's like bad or wrong or shouldn't be done in some way, but I, I also believe in the concept of anonymous good and um, anonymous good is doing things in the world that are good and positive and not taking any credit for it. Because when you take credit for something, there is the level in which that is barter and the person whom you are giving to now feels indebted to you in some way. There is an exchange there. Um, and I don't want that. I just want to do good things in the world in ways that seem to me and my wife and our family, like will be helpful of peoples and places and not take any credit for that and not show off about that and not be lauded for what a great person you are. Like, I don't want, I'm not doing it for that. I'm doing it because I want to do good. And, um, and I can, and I, and I see ways in which I can be of support to peoples and places and, you know, um, and I feel a responsibility to, you know, to use this skill that I have of the ability to generate resource to help people who didn't have as good of a starting place as I had. You know, I was born in the West, man. We're free here. I had the opportunity. Some people aren't, you know, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, so I don't, I don't like to try to talk too much about it, you know. I think you take the same attitude towards, uh, like you mentioned on your website, helping uh you that you care deeply about developing a healthy balanced life as an entrepreneur and how to keep yourself healthy and feeling good and like your social media embodies all of this stuff like i'm looking at you right now there's a smart marketer jujitsu mat behind you that's incredible first off i, I want to have my own branding on on some mats at my house that'd be cool but you know you're you're skateboarding you're jumping in a river naked with your wife or, or you're cooking with your wife and like you uh your social media embodies like you're not asking for anything. There's no transactional there. You're not telling anybody to go buy anything. And you're just, you're, you're trying to represent what you believe, you know, you're, you're trying to be the change you want to see in the world. I do think you got to sell sometimes too, you know? Uh, but I do want to show a different side of what entrepreneurship can look like. Cause everybody sees Gary V hustle, grind, sacrifice, or they see all these people balling out on Instagram and fancy ass cars. And like, uh, you know, it's like, you could also be just a normal person who's laying low, enjoying their life. And I'm all about having, I like to have nice things. I'm not against consumption. I got the most expensive coffee machine money can buy. You know what I mean? Like I'm like, I'm pro consumption, but not for the point of consumption, but for the point, just like consuming to fill a void or consuming because you want to look cool in the eyes of other people, but consuming because you actually want and enjoy the things you're consuming. Uh, you know, I use the shit out of that coffee machine. I love it. You know, I have uh, two $5,000 Apple monitors. I use them every day. I love them. You know, I've got, like I, I got, you know, really fancy electric skateboards, you know, like I spent a lot of money on this land. Like I'm, I'm not anti buying stuff and having fun with money. So I don't want it to come off that way. But I also, um, 
I don't want to, you know, be super showy, you know? Yeah. I think your brand's fantastic. I think it's cool what you've done. I'm glad you came on here to like share. I, I wanted to hear the steps because all you, often all you see is where someone's at now and it, it's hard to look back and see all the steps they've taken through there. Actually, it kind of reminded me of me. Some of the stuff you were doing is jumping around doing 19 different things. And before you kind of settled on one, I think I'm still in that 19 different phase. Um, but yeah, it was very cool to hear your story. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, and each one of these things that's been successful, I went deep on that before I added something else on. You know, I was really deep in e-commerce and services agencies doing super well there before I really went into boom. And I was really deep in boom and successful there before I really went into smart marketer. And smart marketer was off the ground with systems and process and team before I went into Zipify. And of course, I've invested and I had little things on the side here and there, but like, you know, I believe in going deep rather than wide. And thanks for having me on. I enjoyed this super fun, man. And, you know, I think the thing to remember is like comparison is the thief of joy. I don't know whose quote that is, but it's like, you can't compare yourself to someone else because you can only compare yourself to where you were a week ago, a year ago. And if you're moving in the direction of your goals and you're enjoying your life, you've won the game that we call business that, you know, have fun make good stuff that serves the world and try to be profitable. And if you can do that at any level, if you can do it at 50 grand a year, hundred grand a year, you've won. There are many people who have very successful businesses, and a lot of money who are fucking miserable. They're not having fun and they're not making good shit that helps people. And they're maybe not even profitable. You know, they're maybe not, you know, they're shackled to their business. So it's like scale is not everything. Scale's fun, but not at the expense of your personal life. And, um, and at the expense of making something that's truly good that helps people. So, and at the expense of, expense of profit, a lot of people scale and they're not profitable. So I think the game is really, you know, um, have fun first and foremost, because you could die. You don't know how long you got. Make good stuff. Secondly, because you want to feel good about yourself. Keep making your shit better. Always, like you said, with customer feedback and iteration, and then do whatever you can to try to stay profitable. And there you go. And that's the game. Repeat that cycle. Well, I'm glad you came out. You, you always spit knowledge and you always show up for podcasts. I think that's my favorite part about you. Like I've never listened to a podcast where you don't have 9,000 energy and you're just spouting off tons of stuff. So I appreciate you. I felt like um, I rambled all crazy on this one. So, so you got, you caught me at after a super long Monday, bro. And I'm tired, but I appreciate you. You give me the platform. I enjoy, I really enjoy, um, you know, talking with other business owners and entrepreneurs. And I've always really enjoyed hanging out with you and you know, we played cards virtually a couple of times. We obviously met in person, also played some cards and stuff. So look forward to the next time we uh, get a chance to do that. I appreciate it. His course is rock. Go check him out at Smart Market. I'll put the rest of the links in the show notes. He's a good follow on social media too. So thanks a, thanks a ton, Ezra. Big thanks to Ezra for coming on the show. If you want to check out his stuff, you can do it through my affiliate link, learnwithezra.com. I'll put all the links in the show notes as well. Uh, if you were wondering during the show, hey, where do I play poker online nowadays? I play on americascardroom.eu. Uh, you have to buy in with uh, Bitcoin or other crypto, and then you cash back out into Bitcoin or other crypto. Uh, I have a lot of fun. In fact, I won a tournament yesterday while I was sitting here working. Uh, so if you love poker, that's the place uh, to go. Uh, again, Baby is scheduled to come out today of when this podcast comes out, so I will do my best to get back in two weeks once again. Uh, But if you're craving content, especially if you're into the dropshipping world, check out dropshippodcast.com. John Warren, former guest, uh, former two-time guest, and myself are putting out loads and loads of content over there. Uh, $5 an episode. You get all the back episodes for free. I uh, would love to have you over there. If you're into dropshipping whatsoever, I think you're going to really, really find value in that podcast, let alone, again, five bucks per show we put out moving forward and you get all of the back episodes for free uh, tons of value in those episodes so dropshippodcast.com if you want to join us over there and uh hopefully everything goes well i'll see all of you again in a couple weeks <laughs>